Our next item is our annual student achievement report, our SAT results, which Trustee Lightfoot was referencing. Uh, they reviewed in performance just yesterday. So Dr. Swift, do you want to introduce us? Thank you. Thank you. Trustees, and uh, you have some materials in your folder that we'll be referencing um, in this look at our uh, SAT report that we always do in October. And I just want to reference those. And I know that um, Ms. Osinski shared today that we can tomorrow morning post the articles to board docs so that any folks out in the community or staff who would like to also take a look at some of the articles and background information uh, will be welcome to do so also. You do have a printed copy of the annual report. We're just going to use the first few pages of it. And then trustees, just like normal, you have the encyclopedia. And you can stay in that forever, and we can discuss it in one-on-ones. Uh, but we have streamlined for the public presentation. Um, I do want to also uh, thank uh, Ms. Jennifer Colby uh, from Huron High School, who is here as an SAT coach. And you'll be hearing from her in a few minutes. And Dr. Janet Schwamm, principal of Huron High School, who is I know these folks have to get up uh, for school in the morning, and so we'll expedite our part to get you up as quickly as possible. We had just a tremendous discussion in performance yesterday, and performance uh, team members, uh, trustees Lightfoot, uh, Gaynor, and Kelly, um, I did a lot of thinking after that discussion. I felt like that it added a lot of value for me personally. And so I wanted to share just a few things in terms of context um, for the data. Then uh, we'll talk about 2018 preparation. Uh, Jennifer Colby is so graciously uh, stayed out with us late tonight. Uh, she was instrumental in that preparation, and uh, Mr. DeAngelis is here uh, to support that. Um, and then we'll go into the actual report. And then we'll finish by talking about next steps and uh, be in good shape. I included SAT, the Washington Post article, recent article, uh, from October 23rd that talks about the SAT recently reclaimed the title of most widely used college admiss admission test. And just real quickly, the SAT has vaulted past the rival ACT to reclaim its long-held position as the nation's most widely used college admissions test, according to the data provided uh, to uh, the Washington Post, it was about 2.1 million students who took the SAT last spring, along with our approximately 1,300 students in Ann Arbor public schools. A surge in uh, delivering the SAT on school days is what is responsible for this shift. So uh, we're going to talk more about the context around the SAT. Um, and to me, that is all about access and opportunity. So um, if you go to that slide, um, Ms. Osinski, yes, this one. Um, for so many decades, college entrance exams were only available to students whose parents could make sure that they got a college entrance exam, uh, to folks who could sign them up and pay the fee and do all of that. Um, and so we are delighted to be on this list of one of seven states in the country that require 100% of our 11th grade students to take the SAT. Um, for students in those states, the door is wide open for access to college entrance exams. If you add in the states that require ACT on a school day mandated, that brings us to about a dozen states. I just want to point out when we talk a lot about equity 
a dozen states in our country doesn't feel very equitable. And while we're proud to be on the cutting edge of that, here in Michigan, we started uh, back in 2007 with the, SAT, with the ACT. And then trustees, you remember just three years ago, Michigan switched from the ACT to the SAT. This is our third set of SAT data. I was um, intrigued by this article from the Brookings Institute. It, its author is Susan Donarski, whom I follow on Twitter. Uh, she is with the University of Michigan. This is an area of research for her. But she talks about this fact that historically only college track in the old days, they were called students, had the opportunity that all of our students had. The entrance exams are required for admission to almost all selective college and universities in the US. Um, students have to register and pay for the tests and then travel to the testing center on the weekend to take them. It seems like a straightforward process, the researcher says, if you have internet, a computer, a credit card, and a car, and parents who will get you to that location. So when we think about access and opportunity, I just want to point out we're only at the tip of the iceberg. And if we have a change uh, this November that results in a change in our education department nationally, this should be a top priority is ensuring that every student in the country has free and open access to college entrance exams. We're one of a dozen states where the SAT and the ACT and or the ACT are given for free on a school day during school hours. Um, as Janarski notes in this article, um, in most cases, the SAT or the ACT replaces the required standardized assessment, which it does in Michigan. And so there really is no additional time spent to offer this opportunity. We are grateful that the state pays for this assessment, so we're grateful for that. That is still true, Mr. Demetrio, Ms. Dickinson Kelly. Okay, good, just checking. Um, it is an attractive feature, uh, considering that some parents are concerned about assessments. Um, and sitting for the test is required. So a student can't opt out because of the low expectations of their themselves or their teachers or their parents or their neighborhood or the adults around them. The student is required to take it. In Michigan, uh, it became the required test of juniors. And as a result, um, uh, trustees on page two of Donarski's article, I just want to make sure we get this. As a result of the shift in policy, the share of Michigan's high school students taking a college entrance exam rose from 54% to 99%. So my point around context is in Michigan, the door is wide open and it's everybody in and nobody out, and we're proud of that. Now, this idea of universal access, as exciting as that is, brings with it, and this was the core of our discussion yesterday, brings with it its own set of unique challenges. And we know those very well, we see them consistently in all that we do. But on page two, Donarski makes the point I want to leave you with tonight, and that is they've discovered that for every thousand students who score high enough to attend a college or university, another 230 students were revealed through this universal testing setting. So even though we're going to see in a few minutes the disparities that cause us great concern, we, we lose sleep over those disparities as a community because we want every child to be successful. Just by doing the testing, we know that we have 
uh, for every thousand low-income students who had taken the test before 2007 and scored well, we have another 480 college-ready, low-income students who were uncovered by this test. So that, to me, we're trying to find the inspiration here, and that is, to me, the source of inspiration that we're able, so that means in the Ann Arbor Public Schools, we uncovered college-ready students who would not have been found otherwise through um, a universal testing model. So um, many worry that college uh, uh, entrance exams are biased. Uh, I had a, a several great leadership conversations to prepare to be with you this evening, trustees. And one of them was yesterday with the high school principals group. And uh, Principal Louder was sharing with me the work of the college board to reduce the uh, bias that is naturally in their test. There's been a lot of work on that. And yet we know uh, for all the work that's been done, we know that it is a biased experience. We all know that. Um, many worry about that bias and we worry that that bias is against low income and non-white students and it certainly is. But the reality is that these tests are the gatekeepers to selective colleges in the US and the evidence indicates if taking these tests is voluntary, many of our most disadvantaged students will go undetected and, and lose that opportunity. I will finish by saying universal testing will not automatically get disadvantaged students into college. We're not saying that. And yet it produces increases in college attendance and the cost of the tests are cheap. So as we're facing a November election and a possible change at the state level, this is a, an inexpensive way at the state and national level to ensure that the door's wide open and everybody has the opportunity. States have to run a high school test anyway in our current accountability requirements. Parents pay for the college exams if the schools don't, so it's a benefit to our parents. And we know that a universal testing program is one of the least costly ways to increase college attendance rates. Universal and free testing can help us to level the playing field, uncover disadvantaged students who will benefit from college access and opportunity. I want to talk about a couple other trends. Ms. Osinski has a slide. This, these were a part of our discussion yesterday, and trustees, I pulled just a few sources uh, since our meeting yesterday to kind of think a little bit about these other trends, and I know uh, that our school folk, uh, Ms. Colby and, and Dr. Schwamm, can speak to them also. Uh, we know uh, throughout history, uh, whether we're talking about Brown versus the Board of Education, whether we're talking about civil rights, all the great movements, the first wave is achieving universal access. We've done that in Michigan. I'm proud of that. And now we're busy on the second wave, which is ensuring widespread ability to be proficient in this experience and this environment, which is not so easy uh, to achieve. Um, the second area we discussed, or one area, was around mental health and wellness. I was impressed yesterday in the conversation with principals that uh, several of our principals said, our teachers are saying things like, it's okay if you don't do perfectly on this test. And to remember to achieve life balance and and workload balance. And so um, while we do want everyone in the door and we do want to get to the age and to a time where everyone has an opportunity to be proficient, we also understand, and I know that Trustee Manley was recently on the panel for the Race to Nowhere uh, panel discussion. Um, New York Times author Frank Bruni has written quite a lot on the race of college admissions. 
and I'm quoting from him in your article, Rethinking College Admissions, um, the admission process, he says, warps the values of students drawn into this competitive frenzy and who can get the highest score. It jeopardizes, in many cases, the mental health of students, and it fails to include and identify the potential in students from less privileged backgrounds. I've included uh, that article. He has recently, as you probably know, published a book on this topic. But that was one area of discussion that came up in my leadership conversations. The principals were very clear, um, particularly Principal McCoo, that he certainly wants opportunities for every student at his great school, but that having students be able to balance all of their capabilities and not just the one slice, the one measure, is an important piece. And along that line, I include a, included a Washington Post article about the University of Chicago dropping the SAT, ACT requirement. This is a trend, it's not a wave yet, but it is a trend that some colleges and universities are dropping that or making it optional. Um, and this article was from uh, June 14th of this year. Numerous schools, including well-known liberal arts colleges, it says, have dropped or pared back testing mandates in recent years to bolster their recruiting and to ensure uh, one uh, University of Chicago Dean of Admissions says, testing is not the be all and end all. There are also uh, many colleges and universities limiting the number of extracurricular activities that can be added on the application in order to prevent those uh, students who are trying to do everything and really trying to encourage students to focus on a few things. So we've had good discussion on this um, idea of mental health and wellness and the current trends of, of fewer colleges requiring, although the vast majority still do require, um, and really shifting to seeing that student and valuing that student in, the, in all of their competencies. I've challenged the high school teams to begin to think about a kind of badging system where we, and Mr. DeAngelis and the team have been thinking and, and considering this, where students would be honored and badged for their volunteer hours, for their, um, uh, I'm trying to think, Mr. DeAngelis, help me with some of the, for their performing arts engagement, for their civic, civic engagement, but really helping our students to begin to see themselves uh, in a more well-rounded way, and I'll look forward uh, to your discussion of that. Um, for this testing season, we really focused on test prep. And that focus, we worked on in planning committee with Chair Manley and the planning committee last year of this idea of we know that test prep isn't going to dramatically transform overnight a student's scores. But our goal was to help students feel more comfort and more confidence in entering that testing process. So you remember last spring, Mr. DeAngelis and um, others came to planning committee and they talked about integrating into the classroom some structures and strategies. They talked about Khan Academy. And so coming now is Ms. Jennifer Colby to share a few minutes with you on that test prep effort and how it went and how do we know how it went. And Mr. DeAngelis is with her to support. And thank you for staying up late. And you know you're gonna have to get in that microphone so that it gets on TV. There you go, thank you. Thank you. Um, was my list of activities that we do it here on in the board packet? Um, it can be. Okay, it I can have be. copies. Yeah. Oh, you brought copies, yeah. great, thank you. I've got two things. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so let me just start out. Um, my name is Jennifer Colby, I'm a librarian at Huron High School, and for the past four years I've also been the SAT coach. Um, for the past four years, my co-coach has been Wendy Reinhart, who was a counselor, but she retired last year. So. I need another co-coach. <laughs> um, and specifically, I think it's useful to have 
at, at our high schools, where we have full-time librarians, um, it's useful to have a librarian and a counselor because the librarian, and you'll see as I discuss what we have done it here in high school over the past few years, the librarian's able to do in-school lessons because of our flexible scheduling for specific student groups. Um, and the counselor is able to get out the information to the students um, through discussions with other counselors, through class meetings, things like that. So I think that's an important pairing that we've had at Huron. It just kind of happened by a happy accident, but I would recommend that at our other comprehensive high schools. Uh, so our goal, this is what Wendy and I established, and we've adjusted it. Uh, our practices have adjusted over the past four years. But our goal is for every ninth through 11th grade student to get connected to Khan Academy for personalized SAT practice. And we have a special focus on reaching out to our at-risk populations. Um, just in case you don't know what the SAT Khan Academy portal does for you, I have a list on the back of the handout that I've prepared. Uh, so activities that we've done to support this goal include outreach and lessons. Our outreach, um, and this is more on the counselor end, presentations at our freshman, sophomore, and junior meetings about the Khan Academy SAT portal. Um, also in addition to that, in the past we have um, passed out little flyers to parents at our capsule nights. Uh, so that they know what's going on right there at the beginning of the year when the students find out at their at their class meetings. We also send out um, in the spring, usually we'll send out emails to junior parents about the Khan Academy SAT portal and tips for SAT test taking. They, the Khan Academy um, created really helpful and simple videos on how to use the Khan Academy portal and how to answer specific qu test questions in different subject areas. So that's a super helpful video and we've been um, reutilizing re that and sending it out to parents over the past few years. Um, we email all sophomore parents at the end of the school year, uh, uh, so at the end of their freshman year. Yes, at the end of their, no, at the end of the sophomore year we email all sophomore rising junior um, parents to encourage them to sign up for the Khan Academy portal. Um, but hopefully by then we've already reached the, all those sophomore students, and I'll explain that. And then we also mail letters to all junior parents to those who have um, indicated that they don't have an email um, access. And then what we'll do is we reach out to those children in our building um, and work with them individually, find them in their classes and, and work with them to get them connected to the Khan Academy portal. So that's the out outreach that we do. Then um, individual lessons that, that I've been doing um, and Wendy has been doing after school, or had been doing, um, is to get students connected to create an SAT Khan Academy account. And we find more and more students already have a Khan Academy account because mm -hmm. they're doing that with their classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. But then the SAT practice is a separate, basically, uh, topic that they need to connect to. So helping them understand that even if they have a Khan Academy account, they still need to connect to the SAT practice so that they can understand how to use that. And then the, the biggest challenge, uh, I wish this was so much simpler, and someday I invite you to come to see how difficult this is, but to connect um, the student's SAT Khan Academy practice portal with, the, with a College Board account. Um, so that involves two um, creations of an online account and two separate organizations and getting those connected. And I am lucky if I can get 10 students in a class period connected between the two. Um, it is just really unnecessarily complicated. That's my only complaint. I love this program. I think it's wonderful and so useful for our students. Um, but I really wish they would simplify the process. Um, so I'll do individual class sessions with our sophomores. This works out really well at Huron because we have the personal project in the first semester for our MYP students. And they finish it before um, winter break. So the weeks after winter break, they ha we pull them for different uh, purposes, building purposes. We use that time. And one of those things that we do with them is I have every class come in to teach them how to use the SAT Khan Academy portal and connect them to the College Board account. Um, and then we'll also do the same with um, our EL students at all grade levels, our rising scholars, both freshmen and juniors, and also our past students. And our past classes 
are um, at all grade levels for students who have been identified as needing extra help in their coursework. So they have a, a class that, where they have a smaller group of students, and so I'll pull the, those students and help them make sure that they're connected. Because even with all of our outreach, even with connecting with all of our sophomores, of course we don't reach everybody. So then we pull specific groups to help them get connected. Um, then in past years, although the last year was not utilized as much because I think we were putting our efforts more during the school day and that was more effective, we had um, opportunities for juniors to come after school and sign up and with help from, from Wendy or myself. Um, but again, I, I, I think I'm gonna rethink that this year because I feel like we've done so much outreach to our sophomore students that by the time they're juniors, they really are already set. But of course, we'll give an opportunity to any student who, who needs it. And then we also give assistance at Saturday school in January, because even by then, we find students that just still, for one reason or another, have not been able to make um, the connection, either by having the SAT Khan Academy account or make, connecting it to their college board. And uh, it's important for you to understand the connection to the college board account is what gives the students personalized practice. So they can practice for the SAT. They can do diagnostic tests in the SAT practice portal on Khan Academy to get personalized practice. But if they connect their college board account, those PSAT scores and those SAT scores, well, PSAT scores, I guess, are the ones that matter in this case, um, will be automatically uploaded and mm -hmm. analyzed. And then for each content area or subject area on the SAT, you can see what your level is and how um, you can be expected to answer the lower level questions, medium level questions, or any questions in that topic area. So it's, it, I'd, I'd love for you to come see how it works. Um, and then besides the work of the SAT coaches, uh, we've reached out to the, all the math teachers and all the English junior English teachers. Uh, all the math teachers in the spring before the SAT, usually on the March um, early release day, um, I send out enough of these SAT student guides, which has a practice test in it, paper practice test, and a handout based on tips from this booklet and other tips that I found to show students how to do these grid-ins. Just take a look at this and tell me if upon reading this on test day, if you would be able to figure out how to fill these in. So we want to make sure that all students understand how to fill this in before test day is. Because just as a reminder, you are not marked down for any um, answer that you get wrong. So we encourage our students to answer all questions as they are able to. Um, and then, so all of our um, freshman, sophomore, and junior math classes get this lesson. And then we also ask on the same day or before our April 9th testing day, we ask our junior English teachers to do a targeted SAT essay lesson that's been developed in conjunction with the English teachers. So all this being said, the SAT portal on Khan Academy is a tool that I help students connect to. But the most effective preparation is for students to attend their classes regularly and be delivered the content by their Ann Arbor Public Schools teacher. So that is my report. Thank you, Ms. Colby. This is the uh, slide where we just remind ourselves of why this is important at, at all. And certainly, we hear that every child is not going to college, and that is uh, not our goal. But it is our goal that those who have the ability and the choice uh, may go. So it is an outcome measure or an exit measure. measure. It is an opportunity for free of charge college entrance exam, and it does provide information to the system about how college ready our students are. So let's look at the data. Um, I want to remind the trustees, you can see here that the total score slides that we're going to look at are on that 400 to 1600 range. So it is different from ACT. 1600 is a perfect score, 400 is the floor. When you get into the section scores, they are 200 to 800, so that's how they run. And here are our mean scores. You can see three years of taking the assessment, um, and last year we bumped up by about 32 points. That was 
a, a, um, a very big increase. I don't know other districts that made that size of increase. This year, we moderated back more to where we were the first year. So 1168.6 is our mean score. Now let's look inside that data. Trustees, you can see how we compare across the county, across our high performing districts that we always mark ourselves against and across uh, our demographically most comparable districts. And trustees, we always talk about it when you go to the very pat back of your encyclopedia packet, you'll see the demographics of each of these districts. So if you want to dive in that deep, we always do that in committee to kind of compare. Um, and you can see we were edged just a little bit in our median score by Northville and Novi. Um, and yet, when we look at the demographics, our district is extremely different. In fact, we're probably most comparable um, uh, to Troy, actually, in some ways, more than the other two. Um, so you can see how we compare there. Uh, let's look, though. Our most important competitions are with ourselves. And this is exactly what Trustee Lightfoot previewed in her committee report. We know our five areas of concern, our five areas of focus, our five areas where without us getting in the middle of it, students will be at a disadvantage. And you can see that um, all areas uh, other than Asian either fell or remained steady this year. That was a statewide and a national trend. Um, but there are concerns with African-American scores, uh, with our performance of Hispanic students, um, economically disadvantaged English language learners, and special ed students. Often in um, committee, we look down at the bottom at the N. This is not excuse making, it's just an observation. You notice that we had a full 50% more in economically disadvantaged students this year over last year in that junior class. I don't recall ever having seen a shift like that. And in committee, we discussed that a great deal of that shift really was at Skyline High School. And I got their school level uh, information on that today. Uh, they gained a significant number of uh, students from poverty just now different set of kids. I just want to make sure because sometimes we talk about, well, did that many move in? It doesn't mean they moved in. It was over 2017's juniors to 2018's juniors. Um, it was that big of a difference. So um, uh, trustees, there is no excuse making. We are in this work. We are committed. And as we talked about yesterday in committee, this is a long game. This is not a fast game. Um, and we talked about it last year in October. I remember Trustee Manley and, and several of our trustees. This is a community effort. It is a school effort. You're exactly right. We need to be in face-to-face -face conversations with students to find out. We know that Khan Academy is not our program, so we can't get access to be inside of that program, but we sure can hold the hands of students and watch them get on and watch them practice and support them. And trustees, this may be an area, and I know it's not a popular thing to say, considering some of our speakers earlier this evening, but it may be an area where the addition of staff in order to have a time in the day where students could get this hand-to-hand -hand work, maybe that is something that we should think about. I'm just throwing it out there as a thought. Uh, the next slide is really our state comparison. We don't put any stock in that other than looking at the areas where we're not above the state 
at the rates that we expect to be. And I know Ms. Dickinson Kelly works on this every day, but our English language learners, uh, and they had a big upswing last year in their data, and then they moderated more this year, but our economically disadvantaged African-American students and English language learners were not as far above the state in those areas. Hispanic students, however, we are above the state at rates that you know you would expect Ann Arbor to be. So that's really the only use that we have for, for that slide. Um, trustees, that is uh, our report. Our next steps, Mr. DeAngelis is prepared. We, we are gonna do exactly what you've described tonight. We've already been having that conversation, how to connect with students and talk to teachers to see how do we ensure that they're using the tools that have been provided to them um, and that happens, we know, within the regular school day in class. Mr. DeAngelis, what would you add to our next steps as we double down our efforts on this uh, ongoing challenge? Thank you. And I think we've touched on a lot of this in the, in the conversations that we have, but I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, when we see that data, the first thing we run to is how well did we do compared to last year, compared to other years. Uh, and over the course of the last three years, we've seen up and we've seen down, but we've seen a slight trend up, uh, but we recognize immediately those gap areas. When you, you see that slide and we see those subgroups that are under our district average, um, I can assure you um, that our administrators and our teachers um, don't wanna see that. Um, and we recognize that the focus of our equity work around access and opportunity for all students um, goes beyond test prep. It goes to us doing a better job in the classroom. Um, every time I speak to you, I have the privilege of representing the, the, the high school people. Uh, and I think we talked last year about this idea that our through line for the year, and it continues this year, is that our schools are built for learning and they're built for learning for all students. Um, we demonstrate that through our commitment to our equity work. Uh, that commitment to equity work is about engaging students in the classroom. It's about, it's about creating better classroom environments so that all students feel welcomed, supported. Um, it is about um, cultivating that sense of belonging for students. It's about the EOS work we're doing where we wanna see every student that has the capacity to be in front of greater rigor, in front of that greater rigor. It's about the outreach that we know we need to do with especially our underrepresented students, looking at different ways to reach not only them, but their parents and guardians to remind them of the importance. It's not about scoring at 1200 on the SAT so that you can go to college. It's about doing as well as you can because that opportunity one day might, you may want that, that opportunity to be available to you. Um, even when we talk to students uh, in our EOS work about taking advanced placement honors and DP courses, it's not about preparing them for college. It's just about preparing them to be better in whatever their post-secondary whatever their post-secondary plans are. And I'm reminded in this work that we do, and I appreciate that they, the the comments about student voice because what we've found in our EOS work is that understanding student voice is the most important thing that we do. It, it applies to EOS, it applies to the behavioral health work that we're doing with students, it applies to everything that we're doing with trying to imp increase numbers in, in our extracurricular activities, hearing what they have to say, what's of their interest, what their concerns are. And last year when I presented to the group, and uh, whether we've talked about EOS or we've talked about our work, we understand that there are key elements to why students don't engage. The number one thing we know is that they, they lack adult encouragement or don't feel adult encouragement. We know that's the first and most important thing. Um, they don't understand the benefit of why doing this might be of good to them. And there's others, and I won't get into all of them because we've touched on some of them tonight. But what I want you to know is when we see this data, uh, we take pride that we're doing it better than others. Uh, but we immediately turn our efforts to making sure that we're attending to better work around access and opportunity, better work around engaging students, better work about raising students' own, their own efficacy so that we can, we can address those achievement gaps and look for ways, not just with test prep, 
That's one piece of this. But looking at ways that we improve the practice in classrooms where every student is exposed every day. Because one of the things that we can count and one of the things that we can measure is how many times students are sitting in front of highly effective teachers who are giving them the curriculum that meets the rigor of this test and the highest rigor that we can possibly put them in front of. That we can measure every day and to me, just my opinion, and I know it's late, so my opinion may not matter at this point, but <laughs> my opinion, that's the number that we should be measuring more so than how many times they've logged into Khan or, or to College Board. How many times are they sitting in front of lessons in classrooms that have the highest level of rigor and the most attention to the information and the opportunities they need to be successful, not just on this test, but moving forward in their post-secondary time. Thank you. Madam President. The next um, horizon of our work is fighting uh, racism and poverty nationally, and yep. that's, that's the local level, that's the work. And so how do our kids support each other? How do we help change culture? How do we help put better supports in place? And I think that's the frustration and the opportunity that we all have, so thank you. Thank you.